So thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm going to ask everybody to take your seats so we can get started with this event. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Uh, those of you in the back, you're welcome to move up toward the front if you'd like. Um, but I welcome you all to the CSIS Global Health Policy Center. Uh, we thank you for coming. This, is, this promises to be an important and very informative event. Uh, we also want to welcome our viewers online uh, who couldn't be here with us today. Uh, and special thanks to the uh, Christian Connections for International Health, CCIH, for collaborating with us and most especially for bringing our special guests to Washington for their conference and for allowing them to come join us here at CSIS uh, with you all today. Uh, I'd also like to thank Bree Bacchus and Joe Jordan from CSIS for all they did to make this event possible. Um, the benefits of family planning are numerous, not only for women's health and maternal, reducing maternal mortality, but for increasing child survival nutrition, education, economic empowerment, and preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV. This is why family planning is a core component of sustainable development. And today we're here to explore the role that faith-based organizations can play in advancing family planning in their own communities, specifically looking at the cases of Nigeria and Uganda. This is an area that is too often overlooked when we're discussing family planning here in the United States. And this was brought home to me uh, when I was in Ethiopia earlier this year. I met with an Orthodox priest and asked him how he discusses family planning with his followers. And his reply was direct and powerful. He told me, people say family planning is a sin. What is a sin is if you can't feed your children or send them to school. And then he went on to say, from experience, we see that in families with limited children, they grow up well. Women are physically stronger with spaced birth. In many communities around the world, a woman's ability to access family planning and contraception is heavily influenced by religious leaders and traditions. So understanding the intersection between faith and family planning is an essential part of advancing women's access to information and services about family planning. We know that in many developing countries, faith leaders play a significant role in shaping opinions and decisions about marriage, about families, about childbearing, and about health. And we also know that in many countries, faith-based organizations undertake a significant share of the health services, often in partnership with the governments. So learning how faith-based organizations are helping to advance family planning is critical, mm -hmm. at, just as it's critical to understand the barriers they face, uh, and the advantages and disadvantages that they see in their current situations. Okay. There's also great diversity in faith-based efforts from a range of religions and denominations and organizations. Today, we'll be looking at this from the perspective of two Christian-affiliated organizations, uh, medical, FBO medical organizations. And we are honored today to be joined by two such leaders from Nigeria and Uganda, Dr. Daniel Gabgab from Nigeria, and Dr. Tony Tumasidwe. Excuse the pronunciation. Uh, you have, I think, their bios out front. Uh, but just to recap briefly, uh, Daniel is the Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of the Christian Health Association of Nigeria. Uh, he's trained as a physician and holds a postgraduate qualifications in public health and ophthalmology. He spent 22 years working as a health expert at the Church of Christ in Nations and as the Director of Health and Social Services and the past eight years working at CHAN, first as the Director of Programs and now as the Secretary General and the CEO. Uh, previously, Daniel served as the Project Director for managing the implementation of Integrated Reproductive Health and HIV AIDS and Adolescent Reproductive Health Projects in partnership with SEDPA with funding from USAID and the Church of Christ in Nations. Right. Tony is the executive director of the Ugandan Protestant Medical Bureau, mm -hmm. a national umbrella organization for Protestant, Adventist, 
Pentecostal health facilities in Uganda. Mm -hmm. He holds a master's degree in public health and a postgraduate diploma in public health from the University of London and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he also holds a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery degree from Makerere University in Uganda. He's an experienced program manager with years of experience working as a frontline general practitioner in rural and resource limited settings. So we welcome you. We are very honored to have you here. And as we were discussing beforehand, the opportunity to have their voices, to learn from them, to hear their experience, um, and how they themselves got involved in this area of health, I think will help inform our own thinking and the policy discussions here in Washington. So the way we're going to run this is we're going to give each of them a short opportunity to make opening statements, three to five minutes, and then we're going to have a short uh, discussion and ask some of the questions about their work and about family planning and the issues they face. And then, of course, we'll open it up to the audience because we're very eager to hear from you. Uh, and we know you'll have a lot of very interesting things to add to this discussion. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's begin with Daniel. OK, I, I think I want to start by saying I'm, I feel honored and quite very privileged to be engaged in this dialogue, not just to tell you what we are doing, but to also why we are passionate about what we are doing. And I would like to start by telling you my own story and what took me into the realm of maternal child and family health in particular. In my family, we are, there are eight of us. And my mother was pregnant for the ninth, with the ninth pregnancy. She lost that pregnancy, and she almost died as a result of severe hemorrhage. I was just my, that was only my early years in the medical school, and I came and confronted my father, who is a local pastor, and I said, look, we still want to have our mother alive. If anything is to be done, she needs to be helped so that she doesn't get pregnant again at this age. Uh, I think he was able to listen to me, and we took my mother to a mission hospital, and she had a tubal ligation. Today, my mother is alive, but my father has already gone to glory before her. If she had continued that way, I want to believe she would have gone before him. Mm -hmm. Now, that is part of the passion that has made us to see what can I, as a person, do to save the lives of mothers and their children. Now, from the organization I work with, I work for the Christian Health Association of Nigeria. Uh, it's a combination of both Catholic and Protestants, 20 denominations in all. We're working together in promoting health care services generally in our country. The Christians provide not less than 40% of health care delivery services in Nigeria through on 500 different health facilities at different levels and categories. And through that, we're able to offer a range of health services, including family planning. Now, what is clear is that for all of us, we have a common understanding on the fact that whether we call it family planning or child spacing, both and all denominations practice what they believe and their doctrine allows them to practice within that context. Nobody is coerced to do anything. It is highly voluntary, and it is whatever you believe in, it is promoted, and we have seen what can we do among our church congregations and in the midst of our health facilities to see what we can do to offer these services to mothers so that they can stay alive to take care of their children. Yeah. Thank you. Tony. Uh, yes, um, I thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> I work for an organization that uh, basically, has, as you rightly mentioned, looks at uh, health facilities that are over three, about 300. And they are mainly 80% uh, of those are in the rural, in the rural setting. And uh, <clears throat> we offer, as my colleague has already mentioned, a continuum of care. And when you look at the way the country uh, is, uh, we are in those areas that, uh, that the need is, 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 is required most. So they're very hardest to reach uh, areas. Uh, I'm the total opposite of, of, of my colleague in, in, in the way I grew. Um, my family had three children, and I was the third. 
uh, of those of, of, of the three. Uh, however, as we went through life, uh, my my father died at a point uh, in need when I was supposed to go uh, to to senior six. Senior six is uh, the last class before you go to university in Uganda. So I was in senior five when he died, and I lost a year uh, to go to senior six as my mother was. Uh, I was working hard to ensure that resources would be generated for me to, uh, to continue with my studies. I, I always remember one word that, that, that she said, that uh, when I went back to, to school, um, we are three sons, and she was always saying, I wanted more children, I wanted more daughters. However, God did not allow me to have more children. And at that point, uh, it was quite heartbreaking when she said, I've managed to secure resources for you to go to your final class. Now, I'm a medical doctor. Now, had we been many, uh, she's very clear that maybe I would not have gone to university uh, at that material point. So that turned my, right, my, my life around. I come from uh, a community uh, uh, that, that uh, is heavily or highly densely populated, the Bachiga community. We are known to be, to be migrants. Uh, on average, uh, a family in my village has uh, about eight to ten children. And my family, my, my father was the total opposite. But despite all that, he didn't seek out for another woman. And that is one of the things that, that helped us. So when I finished my university, uh, I thought I needed to do something uh, about it. And so I spent ten years of my, my early career uh, in the hospital in rural Uganda. Uh, helping and supporting uh, mothers and seeing what was happening in our community uh, in southwestern uh, part of the country, uh, I developed uh, the, the passion. I thought initially I would study uh, obstetrics, but by virtue of my role as a medical director, it became very difficult for me to do uh, obstetrics, so I went into public health. But even when I went into public health, uh, reproductive health and family planning issues uh, that reflect the lives of the common person uh, in our context being the women uh, became uh, one of the frontline issues. So even as, uh, as I moved on to become the executive director at the national level, uh, we feel as an organization that that's an area that, that we need to uh, passionately work on and see how uh, we can help our country. Uganda is one of those countries who is one of the fastest are growing populations uh, in the world. And, and we think that uh, uh, <clears throat> unless we are able to control that growth in a manner that can both balance the numbers of people with the economy that we have, it will be very difficult for us to live a better lives in our country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you'll agree there's very compelling stories in terms of how you got involved in this work. And now both of you are leading uh, faith-based medical organizations in your countries. Mm -hmm. And I thought it might be interesting to start out describing what kinds of family planning services you provide and what kind of contraceptive methods are available through your, through your clinics. OK. Um, like I said earlier, we are both Catholic and Protestant. And therefore, we provide all, both the natural family planning methods and the other contraceptive devices. Now, the most common in Nigeria generally, the most common uh, family planning method that is used are the male condoms, followed by the injectables and the pills. These are very commonly used and uh, they are available. The implants and IUCDs come next, and that is related to the skills of the workers that ought to provide it, but they are there in particularly where these services and those who are trained are able to provide that. So that is about the range of uh, uh, family planning services that we are able to offer. And our staff within the health facilities and others are trained to be able to provide these services based on their faith, whether it is the natural method or the modern contraceptive method. And, and that range is available for all those who are interested in whatever method that they would want to go into. The government of Nigeria provides all these uh, contraceptive methods, but something that is coming up newly is the, 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 the standard days method and also the, the, the beads method. These are coming up, and a lot of people are being trained, particularly for those who are interested 
in the natural method so that it makes it available to them. Uh, and that basically is the range of uh, uh, services that we are able to provide through the health facilities. But the, what we do most through the congregations is giving adequate and proper education and awareness for them to know what, what to do, where to go, and select the method that they think is most appropriate for them within their faith. And so there is often a cross-reference of clans from a Catholic facility to a non-Catholic facility to get about whatever method they are interested in, and the other way around also happens. Because, no, I mean, we do not segregate and say Catholics go to Catholic facilities alone, or Protestants go to Protestant facilities alone, but rather people go based on the facility that is closest to them, based on need, and from there through counseling and the rest, and you know what they need, then you do the cross-references appropriately so they can get the service made available to them uh, according to their choice. It is highly voluntary, and therefore after the counseling one-on-one, -on -one, the client chooses what method she wants to use. Yeah. Can you describe to us some of the, the different ways that you provide different methods at the different levels of your hospitals? Um, yes, uh, we, we provide uh, all, all methods uh, to, to, throughout our network. Um, <clears throat> our facilities uh, range from the primary health care level all the way to uh, hospitals. And, and the hospitals are also segregated from highly specialized to general hospitals. So um, currently the system, rather before the system was, was such that the hospitals would be the ones to give uh, the permanent, for example, uh, the tubal ligations and the vasectomies, that would be uh, hospital best. And then uh, the commodities like uh, pills, uh, condoms, uh, would be for the level twos, which is uh, part of the primary level care. And then the level threes and level fours would then give the IUDs and, and the injector, the injector plans. However, currently, uh, we've, uh, uh, through support of uh, one of the grants that we have from, from the Packard Foundation US, we are now redefining the delivery uh, of family planning methods. We are now moving to the communities, okay? Uh, unlike what has been happening, that has been facility-based. So with that grant, we are now going to the communities uh, in a sense of training community health workers and allowing them uh, to be able to distribute uh, resources. So basically, we are trying to close the gap between the facility and the communities. Now, in addition to that, uh, we are also taking the permanent methods to the communities through uh, conducting camps, or what we may want to call as surgical camps. So we have a camp of, of specialized, uh, a team of specialized people, uh, nurses with doctors, going together with the community health workers in a particular community and offering a whole range uh, of care. And that would be uh, after the counseling session and when people feel, uh, decide on the uh, services they want to take, would then be able to do tubal ligation, we then do the vasectomies, uh, and then uh, we are able to do the IUDs, the implants, and other commodities, with a view that uh, another team will come in as a follow-up to see how patients are doing. So with that grant, we are now transforming the method of delivery to the community level, uh, unlike uh, the past. Yeah. Maybe let me add to say that uh, in some of our resource-limited uh, areas, we have been able to do some task shifting of training community health extension workers to be able to provide injectables mm -hmm. at that level, which uh, a couple of years back was not happening. And so a curriculum was developed for them to be able to at least provide injectable uh, methods at the community level. And, and that has helped a great deal in reducing distances for mothers to go to secondary facilities to be able to access that. Is there, do you see a difference in uh, the attitude of the communities, learning about family planning through mm. organizations like yours that are linked to uh, faith institutions. Mm. Is there a difference in the way you talk about family planning and is there a difference in the uptake you see in mm. services? Certainly, um, because we're a faith community, we try to use biblically based messages for them to understand why has God created us? 
God has made us in his own image. He loves us. And we are the temple of God. And therefore, God expects that if we are his temple, we should take care, good care of that temple. Now, mothers are a temple of God. And they ought to be taken good care of. Their health must be ultimate, ult I mean optimum, for them to be able to do their biological function of reproduction. Uh, and so using a lot of Bible verses and uh, reasons why we, the, the, the need to make sure that they space their pregnancies and deliveries in such a manner that they are strong and healthy enough to expect another pregnancy to come. They are also strong enough to take care of their babies so that they're taken care of and so on and so forth. There's always the aspect of, yes, God has said we should multiply and fill the earth. Agree. But then on the other hand, the Bible says, he who does not take care of the immediate need of his family is worse than an infidel. And we don't want to be infidels. We are people of faith. And using such methods for awareness creation and teaching, it has brought in a lot of difference and changes in the perception of what mothers would expect and what also the men would also expect because we have tried to see in what way you know, the African setup, Nigerian setup is dominantly male, and therefore these messages are passed on both sides, not just to the women, in order to try and see how we can balance it and then promote acceptability. And then the practice, as I've said earlier, will be based on their theology and doctrine appropriately. Hi, yes, do you want to add um, to that? Just to add something on that. Uh, the way our facilities uh, are established uh, as a result of the need uh, within that particular community. Now, you find a community that has uh, a church, and that community realizes a need in terms of health care, and then they come up uh, with an initiative of establishing a facility. So wherever you would go uh, within our network, you'd find that uh, almost... 60 to 70 percent of the facilities, wherever they are, there is a church. Okay, so that is the way the, the setup uh, is. So, in other words, whenever you're taking any service to any particular facility, there is no way you're going to run away from the church. Okay, so the family planning work that we are doing, uh, we, we realize that we, we cannot run away from the church, and, and that's why the method we are using is, is involving the church leadership. Uh, as uh, part of the entire process. So we are training church leaders uh, <clears throat> to be uh, messengers, uh, to understand what family planning is all about, because one of the biggest challenges that we had realized that even the church leaders in our context were having many more children than anybody else in the community. Okay? So we thought that uh, before you go to the community, you have to start at the leadership level. Okay? Because it is the some church leaders who are wedding the young girls in the communities, okay? Yes. So <clears throat> that's why uh, we've come up with a, method, a, a training mechanism where we even identify uh, what I may want to call, uh, not pioneer, but uh, champion uh, church leaders who then uh, go on even to be part of the training of other church leaders. So that is the mechanism that we are using. We are involving the church. We are causing them to be part of the entire process. And even we are seeing uh, the summons that are being given are also beginning to look at family planning as a critical uh, issue in our setup. Have you seen any change in uptake in family planning services mm -hmm. since you began to work in this training of the religious leaders? Yeah, uh, we, we did a baseline survey um, <clears throat> uh, when we were starting uh, this work with the church. Uh, it's just now one year down the road, but we are seeing lot, uh, the uptake, we're considering the baseline that, that had been done. Uh, we are already seeing uh, changes. We are already seeing also uh, messages coming in from the congregation, uh, even the religious leaders themselves. Uh, we've, uh, like for example, we've had uh, captions of religious leaders quoting their Christians who are even asking them why the messaging in the church is, is, is changing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we are, we are beginning to see some of those things. And I want to believe that by the time uh, next year, possibly by mid uh, next year or early, early next year, when we'll be doing a midterm review of the work that we are doing, we'll be able to, to demonstrate 
uh, significant uh, changes yet. And my understanding is you're going beyond just the Christian religious leaders. Yes. Can you describe the range of leaders who you've brought into some of these trainings? Yes. Uh, when, we had, when, we identify, when we decide to zero down on a facility uh, that is going to be the primary uh, focus of a particular of the work, uh, we look at the entire community around that health facility. And that community does not only involve the Anglican or Adventist or the Pentecostal uh, religious leadership, but it also has the other faith. We have the Catholic, we have the Muslim, uh, we have the Orthodox. At national level, we've been working very well uh, with them. So even when we go down to the trainings, we do the trainings with them. And uh, we've seen uh, significant uh, interaction uh, where religious leaders are discussing this issue, uh, the way they perceive it, and the way uh, they, are, they are working, they are seeing themselves working together. Um, because as you know, one of the biggest challenges that, that we've been seeing has been looking at, at numbers. Each faith, for example, was looking at what is the population in terms of percentage uh, of, of this faith versus the other faith, was seeing those issues. But at the grassroots level, as we do the training, we are involving all of them. And uh, we've seen uh, interesting scenarios where uh, the Muslim leadership, together with the Anglican and the Catholic uh, leadership in terms of faith, discuss, for example, the, the family planning uh, tool under the, the natural family planning using the cycle bed, you know, debating about it and coming out to an agreeable position on the cycle bed. Okay. So we, we are really seeing some significant uh, movement towards uptake of family planning methods. Yeah, maybe a little comment on that. For, for us in Nigeria, particularly in the northern part of the country, which is dominantly Muslim, we've not really gone into, say, we do a joint training with them, but we have a significant number of our health facilities in the far north. The way we run family planning services is that, particularly for women who are in border, who cannot come out in the daytime, these services are offered to them at night. They would move into the health facilities. The health workers will counsel them. And at the end of the day, if they choose a method, it is offered to them. That is something that we have seen that works because about 90 to 95 percent of attendance in our health facilities in the northern part of the country, in my country, are Muslims. And those of them, and we are grateful that at least there are some community-based and uh, organizations and civil society organizations from among those communities that support these services. And therefore, the church works through those community-based and, and organizations in order to reach their own members. And then they create demand from there, and we are available to provide the services. Daniel, you had mentioned that there are obvious advantages and disadvantages of being both a faith-based organization providing family planning as well as both representing Catholics and Protestants. And you've talked about some of the advantages. What are some of the disadvantages? What are some of the challenges you face both as your organization um, and as a faith group trying to promote these, these methods? Yeah, I, I think one key challenge is the understanding of what family planning is. Now, some sort of think family planning has to do with abortion. But we are always saying that family planning actually prevents abortion. And sometimes the word family planning therefore seems to be confusing and people sometimes feel, okay, we're talking about child spacing. Okay, if you spell your child, space your pregnancies, let's say three years interval, at the end of the day, the fundamental issue is that the number of children that you would have would be, would be such that both mother and child are healthy. One of the key targets is how healthy would be the mother before the next pregnancy. And through that activity, we'll be able to achieve what we really would need. And therefore, that's one key challenge of think, people thinking. And therefore, it takes, it's taking us a lot of efforts to explain and teach why abortion has nothing, I mean, why family planning has nothing to do with abortion. So that's one key issue. Now, the other aspect is the fact that because some, for the fact that uh, the Catholic have their standing policy, 
no family planning except the natural one, for Chan as an organization, for us going in full-fledged, it's taking us so long to really work with partners to now say we are making a breakthrough towards saying that our central procurement uh, department, which brings in drugs and other supplies, have not been able to centrally procure family planning commodities for the faith communities in Nigeria because of that policy of being together with the Catholic group. Now we are working on that and gradually I think we are understanding one another and we are praying and hoping that we know in no time this will be made available. The real major constraint there is that we family planning commodities come only through the government, a public sector, and oftentimes they don't even have enough for their own facilities and therefore they will conserve that for the public health facilities and just give a little to us. And you find out that we end up bridging by buying in the open market in order to continue the services. So if today they come and it is free, tomorrow they come, they charge a fee because the source that they usually get from is limited. That has resulted to limiting sometimes our reaching those who would really uh, access some of these uh, services. I think these are some of the key constraints, but I think we've been praying and I think God is answering our prayers very shortly. We should be able to understand and now say, Let's have the range of commodities and whatever you think you need and want, use it. The other one that is liberal, that wants to use it, please take. You that will prefer the uh, natural methods, whatever it is, we are conducting training so that those services are also available, that will be safe and, and also appropriate for people according to their faith. Mm -hmm. Do you, Tony, also have problems with stockouts? Yes, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, Within the national uh, supply chain mechanism, uh, it's, it's mainly the national, uh, what we call the national medical stores that, that mainly stocks uh, commodities uh, under family planning. And uh, <clears throat> there's been a problem in how much of those commodities uh, trickle down to our side, uh, which is the faith-based uh, side. Uh, however, uh, <clears throat> last year we were able to have a breakthrough uh, whereby we now have uh, a public-private partnership for health policy, which was not there. Uh, which, and, and by that, it meant that uh, the mechanism of working between the private not-for-profit sector uh, and the government was not clear. So we were there offering the service, but within what somebody was asked, what context are you, are you doing this? But at least now that that has been defined, uh, now it is clear that we can access the commodities. So the challenge now that, that we still have is how do you move those commodities from Kampala, which is the, the center of the country, to 500 kilometers, 600 kilometers away, where a health facility two uh, is situated, or facility three, that, that, that is offering uh, such care. So that has been the biggest challenge. However, we are grateful that uh, through PEFWA, there is now a program uh, under the USID uh, that is funding uh, what we call the Uganda Health Marketing Group uh, to uh, provide commodities uh, to the private sector. And those commodities are taken all the way uh, to the facilities that qualify for that. So we are engaging with them and they're very positive. And uh, <clears throat> through that mechanism, we are trying to see the streamlining of the supply chain of family planning commodities uh, coming to, to fruition. Mm -hmm. Do you integrate family planning into your HIV work? Yes, we do. Uh, that, is, uh, that is part of, of the work that we are doing. In, <clears throat> as part of the, the MCH uh, package, uh, which is under uh, the, the comprehensive HIV work that we are doing, family planning is a core, is a core area there. And uh, <clears throat> when you test mothers, uh, we also look at family planning as part of the package. If, for example, a mother is positive um, and they're supposed to come and deliver, uh, we, we say, okay, fine, you're positive, but then you have to make sure that, because remember, every time they conceive, that's the risk. So we try to prevent as many risks as possible. So if it's a mother and she's positive, even if she has the right to have maybe a child, we still give them the antiretroviral treatment to ensure that they are coming to antenatal clinics, but we provide other mechanisms to ensure that they're not able to come the following year uh, to deliver again. Because we know that uh, delivery as a process is also a risk to the unborn baby. 
Yeah, so that's, uh, we ensure that family planning is part of the pocket. And for those ones in particular, we look at the condoms, but also we uh, help them get a second uh, method so that they are usually working on a dual uh, sort of uh, family planning undertaking uh, as part of their lives, yeah. Yeah, something just came up, but I remember one key challenge that we have mm. is providing sexual and reproductive health services to our youths. It's a major issue in the church, and we are struggling with it, and we're trying to see how best that aspect can be penetrated to provide appropriate and good information to our adolescents about their sexuality, mm. about reproductive health, and family planning. That is a very sensitive area for our church, mm. and uh, we are very careful about that with our church leaders to make sure that until we're really able to understand why and the why and the what, it is uh, something that we still needs to be explored so that it is expanding. Uh, and with that, you, we were still a lot of teenage pregnancies, 12, 13 year old coming with a pregnancy, legally married. So what do you do? She has had no information about family planning and uh, all that. So that's a key area of a challenge that we are praying and working to see how best we can balance mm -hmm. our theology with the real practice of those adolescents that are very sexually active. That was actually my next question to okay. you, was about not only youth broadly, but particularly the young girls, young the girls. adolescent girls, yeah. the young women. Mm -hmm. And maybe can you talk to us about some of the uh, opportunities you see and some of the challenges that you use, some of which you just described in reaching not just youth, which is important in itself, but also finding the safe ways, safe spaces, so that the young women, the girls, can get the information they need to protect themselves? Yeah, uh, one is uh, integrating those services among youth programs in schools, primary schools, secondary schools. There are uh, lots of uh, youth programs at that level that usually when you are talking about HIV AIDS, which is permissible and acceptable, we integrate some of these sexual and reproductive health messages at that level. Uh, if you people have also been able to establish youth-friendly centers where youth gather to play indoor games and other games together. And then while they're interacting among their peers and the groups, uh, there's always a counselor available by the corner to talk to them one-on-one -on -one for those who would want one kind of uh, counseling service or the other. And, and that has been an opportunity which we have used. Within the church structure too, there are lots of yeah. youth groups who organize special activities and programs for themselves. And sometimes we use, make use of that opportunity to have an opportunity to say a word or two to them about their sexuality and reproductive health issues so that from there, they'll be able to know that, okay, there are areas that they can access some form of further counseling and services where they think the need will arise. I think these are some of the opportunities that we have had and we are cashing it on it to see how we can reach these young people. Mm -hmm. We know that often reaching the girls is harder than reaching the boys because the boys come and play the game, <coughs> congregate often in a way that's not as easy for the girls. Mm -hmm. Can you describe some of the ways that you're trying to reach out, especially to adolescent girls and young women? Yeah, yes, uh, in, in some of the areas where, where we are working, uh, we have very high uh, fertility rates. Uh, to such an extent that by the time a girl reaches her 30th birthday, they already have eight, ten children. It's a very sad uh, situation indeed, because you find a girl being married off in two, uh, <clears throat> being married off at, at an age of 12, at an age of 13. Because uh, <clears throat> in such communities, the moment the girl starts menstruating, then to them, they think those are cows, okay? Cows in a sense of riches. Mm -hmm. The moment a girl just starts menstruating, the parents already start thinking of money, okay? It's time for this girl to go so that we can get resources in. So the challenge has to be at the community level. You have to look at the leaders, you have to look at the, the church leadership, you have to look at, uh, we've been trying to look at the leaders themselves in the communities who are also part of the entire, entire process. 
So yes, as we've, uh, we've tried to do the youth-friendly services, but even, even with the youth-friendly services, you tend to see only boys uh, in those youth-friendly services, and the girls have been left out. Uh, within the church structure, we have uh, the mother's union, the mother's groups that are trying to reach out to, to these girls. But again, when you look at the way they are doing it, it's like it's a mother's, you know, by the definition, it is a mother's, okay? It's a mother's union, it is a mother's group. So it is, it's like even to the girl, it, that's an, a thing for the mothers. It is not for us, the, 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 the young girls. So currently we are, we are engaging with the church leadership so that we can have a clear uh, mechanism, clear space that specifically targets uh, this particular group uh, of, of young girls. Uh, otherwise, the way it appears, it's like for the young girls, is only uh, holiday time when you have to go to the beaches and then you maybe you minister to them. But there is no concrete program that is there specifically targeting uh, the young girls. That girls in the communities are being followed up, are being taught. You know, they are left, of course, traditionally we had those uh, aunties who were there. But the way the world has moved, we've, we've closed off many of those mechanisms that were there to train the girls. And I think we just have to go back to the drawing board, look at what is happening, together with the leadership that is there, uh, in our context, the church leadership, and then develop specific and tailored programs for the girls. It might be interesting before we turn to some of what you've learned here while you've been in the US, mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about the situation in your own countries in, the, in terms of the political leadership mm -hmm. and the support or lack of support for some of the family planning programs. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start with describing the Nigerian government's attitude? Well, um, for the Nigerian government, even though there are efforts with, uh, two, two years back, efforts to see how they can enhance and step up family planning services, there is no direct whether agreement or memorandum of understanding in any form with the faith-based groups. So everything based on goodwill of whatever we are able to get at any given time. And that has been a key issue between us. Uh, the, the political will of adequate and proper partnership to support the faith base, seeing that they are serving the generality of Nigerians, has not come out very clearly. And therefore, there is no definite MOU or agreement as to what we, government can do along with faith base to uh, really work out the issue of family planning services uh, in Nigeria. Um, you know, we're a very populous country estimated at 170 million as of now. If in this room we were all black Africans, possibly one out of five or six would have been a Nigerian. And, and so we're quite many, and so there's a lot of competition for resources, and the advocacy that we make hardly falls, also often falls short because of the competition for the resources for one thing or the other, and therefore their priorities are not really facing some of these things appropriately. Now, in the Nigerian context, too, we have very weak health systems. The tertiary, secondary, and primary health systems are st there. The structure is there, but the health systems are still weak. And, and therefore, we, 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 that has affected a lot of uh, service delivery, uh, both in the public and for those of us who are, are, are faith-based. Uh, but then, uh, in, the, in recent times, you are aware of the insurgency that is going on uh, in Nigeria. Uh, some of us call it um, a political war with a religious garment, uh, and, and that has affected services in the northern, particularly northeastern part of Nigeria. And uh, as you know, the international community's attention is geared towards that, and we're hoping and praying that something definitely is done, because a lot of, uh, there's virtually no functional faith-based facility that is standing in this core area of the Boko Haram uh, insurgency. The health workers escape with their lives narrowly, and the service, the health facilities are virtually destroyed, including churches. And so those are some of the political situations that are really affecting service delivery in general. But you can imagine what is happening in those displaced camps of mothers and children, and what will be happening in those areas. So these are issues that are 
really serious and is present the government of Nigeria, and uh, we're hoping that uh, these issues really come to an end soon so that the common people are able to access the services that they dare need. Government have not really been there, felt physically with services, except for the first base. But we're hoping that uh, it will end soon and people will go back to see what we can do mm -hmm. to help these people. But we are working in some of those displaced camps to bring whatever relief we can through medical services or uh, providing the kind of rehabilitation that we're able to do appropriately as faith-based organizations. And in Uganda, what's the level of mm. political support for family planning from the government? Yeah, um, U Uganda is one of those interesting countries where we've, uh, as a country, we've signed so many um, <coughs> charters. Uh, charters, okay? Uh, I think we're part of the coalition of this, coalition of that. Uh, but to me, I look at that as the technical side of things. But when you, it comes to the practical uh, aspects, our political leadership has not been very supportive in line with the issue of family planning. So that's the pr practical aspect. Uh, because on many occasions, uh, the, the key leadership have been uh, quoted as, uh, as looking at numbers as, as critical, because they're looking at numbers with economics, uh, and not looking at it in the co other, other context. So I would say it's a mix, okay? It's like you the technical people, you're hearing this, and then tomorrow you hear something else from the political. And then the following day, you hear the political leadership again supporting you. So it's not been very clear, uh, clearly. It has not been coming out clearly in terms of where uh, things are going. But also, I think it's also as a result of uh, uh, much of the northern part of the country having been uh, through a long standing war. Uh, and when you look at the population in those areas, it's, it's, it's been a, a real disaster. So talking to those people about family planning, considering that many of them don't have children, is also uh, difficult. Uh, but then at the same time, when you look at the Uganda uh, Demographic Health Survey, uh, and look at the poverty levels. Uh, it is now clearly coming out that uh, with the regions that are, are doing well uh, in terms of poverty eradication, uh, also uh, child spacing is, is coming out uh, clearly. So it's, it's a bit of a mix. And, and to me, I think uh, what I would have loved to see is the political leadership looking at it in the context of, yes, there is this in this region, but what message should be going out in this region? versus what message should be going out in different regions, other than just going out openly uh, to either go against family planning completely. Yeah. Mm. So the messages are against family planning. Yeah, you, 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 you hear some of that, yeah. yes. I think, I know that there's lots of people who are gonna wanna ask questions, but I think it would be very helpful to hear a little bit from you about your meetings here in Washington. I know you were here for the CCIH conference over the weekend, and then you had an advocacy day yesterday and you were able to meet with Republican and Democrat uh, offices. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you discussed with them in terms of family planning? Mm -hmm. What you may have heard that um, surprised you? Some of the messages that you tried to convey to them? Yeah, we, my team met a couple of people and uh, one thing that I saw that was quite different from the Nigerian context was the ease with which you see people and they receive you very easily at that political level, which is so difficult for us back home. Uh, but when it comes to family planning uh, specifically, I think what I got, which uh, stands out, is when we were talking about it, somebody said, no, we are a bit careful talking, saying uh, anything around family planning. Uh, I think personally, I understand if you talk about uh, child spacing. So we said, okay, child spacing, if we can space our children, that would be good enough uh, through whatever way that we space. So it was like, for me, coming from uh, Africa, Nigeria, and then I hear somebody in America saying no child spacing and not family planning, it was something that uh, hit me a little bit on the face. And, uh, but then, uh, it gave me the opportunity to know that I think that is why CCIH made it 
as an important aspect to us to go and talk mm -hmm. so that people will know that family planning is relevant and is important. It should be supported through whatever means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, I share some of those, uh, of those feelings. And uh, <coughs> uh, one of the things that, that, that I found quite, quite fascinating is uh, you, you go to, uh, to this office and uh, as a senator or a congress uh, a person has, has a list of staff uh, working behind to ensure that they are well informed or they have all the right uh, information, right uh, <clears throat> issues around what they are going to talk about. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> also, what I found quite quite interesting is the the way we were able to interact with, with the staff, uh, with openness. Uh, at least at that point, I'm, I'm not sure what happens after that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but at least at that point, the interaction, the the tackling of the real issues. I thought that was quite uh, quite interesting. But also one of the things that I thought was interesting was that uh, the, one of the areas that we visited was uh, <clears throat> they could not understand that religious leaders are also talking about this thing. So I thought that was also very, very interesting uh, and uh, uh, to see that there are, there are all these issues uh, going on. And, and to me, I think uh, CCIH gave us an opportunity to, to show that actually even for us in the faith sector, uh, it's not that we are just occupying space, but we are doing something about it. You can see I, I could ask questions to these gentlemen all day, uh, but I think that's a perfect segue to maybe, mm -hmm. before we open it up to the audience, maybe to give uh, Ray Martin from CCIH an opportunity to explain a little bit about uh, how CCIH has been working to advance these issues in this country through the faith community, um, for those of you who, who aren't aware of it. Maybe, Ray, you could give us a second, wait for the microphone so that people online can hear you. Um. Yeah, thank you, Janet. I have to say initially that I'm absolutely thrilled that an event like this can happen. Thank you to CSIS and Janet to you for uh, organizing and hosting us. And uh, Danielle and Tony, thank you for joining us at the CCIH conference, helping us in the advocacy day, mm -hmm. and uh, sharing your, your stories and your experience in your respective countries with all of us today. You know, uh, CC, CC, I've been with CCIH actually for about 20 years. And maybe uh, eight, eight, nine years ago, uh, I was giving a lot of thought to how, whether, well first whether, before the how, it was first whether CCIH should start talking about family planning. Uh, some of you know that uh, at USAID I was a population officer, so I, ha I had plenty of experience in population and family planning, but not, not so much in a faith context. And uh, what, was, what was going through my mind was that if, if family planning or child spacing or healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies or whatever term you use is, is uh, unequivocally good health for mothers and babies and families and communities, it, it has to be Christian. How, how can it not be? And so despite all the risks and sensitivities in taking on a topic that uh, is, is challenging, it seemed to me that an organization that's a large network of Christian organizations and individuals with a mission statement of promoting global health and wholeness from a Christian perspective, we have to be brave and talk about family planning. So Henry Mosley, Douglas Huber, some of you know these people, you know, we, we all sort of strategized, and our cautious board said, why don't you organize a session at the next CCIH conference on family planning? So we did that, and uh, there were no lightning bolts striking from the sky, so that emboldened us, emboldened us a little bit, and we sort of expanded cautiously from there, and our board got more and more uh, comfortable with family planning. 
we were very careful to position family planning in a way that was the, the way we heard it discussed today, that was uh, uh, both evidence-based, uh, data-based uh, in a public health sense, but also respectful and sensitive to the religious or theological or cultural uh, realities of various denominations or various communities. And, uh, and that, I think, was key in the success that we had in advancing family planning as something that was not only uh, public health uh, justified, but was also uh, consistent with, uh, with Christian values. So in 2008, we conducted a survey of our members and found, a bit to our surprise, that actually none of them were opposed to family planning if properly <coughs> positioned. Yes, there were risks, cautions, challenges, you had to talk about it carefully, but, uh, but the concept of family planning was acceptable. So uh, we got more involved. We then got a grant from the UN Foundation to uh, you know, publicize our views. We worked with Congress and Capitol Hill, and uh, that program has been quite accept, uh, ac accepted and I think has changed attitudes to some degree. I mean, there's no question in my mind that uh, people or organizations that would not have talked about family planning five years ago, some more conservative in circles, denominations, and so forth, are now talking about family planning, uh, again, in a way that's respectful of cultural and theological uh, differences and, and realities. But the, the underlying importance of child spacing, healthy timing, spacing of pregnancies, whatever you want to call it, we don't care. Uh, that is uh, becoming more and more established and I think acceptable in, uh, in conservative and faith circles. And so our interest now is in um, continuing this effort here in the United States to uh, change perceptions of family planning and of course always making sure or trying, it's difficult sometimes, that family planning is not conflated with abortion. That's in this country, in the political sphere in this country is unfortunately a problem. And we're uh, looking for opportunities and uh, slowly finding them to work with uh, partners in Africa and elsewhere, Christian health associ associations like UPMB and CHAN. And so our, our commitment now is to work with uh, faith communities, our membership around the world, in uh, expanding and uh, strengthening and promoting family planning as an integral part of uh, maternal and child health. Thank you, Ray. And uh, our, I, I do want to say uh, our, our chief coordinator for a lot of this effort is Mona Bormet, right here. And Mona Bormet is all around Washington. Uh, conveying this message, and we're going to be uh, continuing to push uh, forward in this area. Thank, thank you, you, Janet. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Mona, for, for all your help. So now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Please identify yourself uh, when you ask a question, and I think we'll take uh, groups of three, and then we'll turn it over for some responses. So we'll start back here. Uh, yes, hi, Britt Minchel, Pastor Britt from the Renaissance Institute in Baltimore. Uh, when I was doing my last book about eight, 10 years ago, I made reference to a breaking story at the time when the US government defunded a program that was helping young girls that had been prematurely impregnated. And as a result, they were having terrible incontinence problems and were being thrown out by their families. It was a horrible story. Uh, I often wondered, I never followed it up, I'm, I should have. Are you the guys that came along and rescued that effort, or is, is it being done, or did it just languish? Thank you. Thank you. Um, question up here in the front. Thank you, I'm Hannah Claus, I'm from the Teen Star Program, and I'm wondering, have you looked at all at what this happens to the status of women when they use various methods of family planning. I also, when the time comes, would be happy to tell you about our Teen Star program in Uganda. We just finished a PEPFAR grant, but that's a separate issue. 
Hi, Beth Robinson from the Futures Group Health Policy Project. I wonder if the years-long effort to reposition family planning in West Africa has had a noticeable impact in, in Nigeria, for example, in your experience, sir? Okay, so why don't we start with those three. We had the fistula question, uh, we had the status of women using family planning, and then the repositioning of family planning in West Africa. So, Yeah, the fistula program, there are two main fistula treatment services in Nigeria, one in the north and one in the southeast. And they are doing a great work of making thousands of repairs of these fistulas and rehabilitating them thereafter and then reintegrating them into this, their societies. Mm -hmm. and, and that is going on. One is a public government hospital and the one up north in Jos where I live is actually a, 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 a Christian hospital and they're doing a very great job and that is continuing uh, a lot. Yeah, yesterday we were with uh, a fellow from Niger Republic. They are also doing something like that and I think Niger has the worst case scenario uh, in the, in, within the sub-region, and, and I think they are also doing a lot of work. The key thing is not just repairing the fistulas, but also ensuring that at least a lot of community-based activities are going on to see how much of the prevention of those things occurring would happen. But it's an uphill task because we are working, a lot of these fistulas are prevalent in communities where these things are like, uh, had to do tied with uh, cultural practices. And until those cultural practices are completely changed, uh, repairing those fistulas will not end the matter. And I think that is the greater job that an effort that is being done, reaching the men and women and religious leaders within those communities where this practice is very prevalent. Because it's associated with girls that are given out in marriage too early. And of course, they have prolonged labor, and at the end of the day, they leak urine, they leak feces, and they become outcasts in their communities. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they are just wandering everywhere. Some of them come voluntarily when they hear about it. Some you have to actively search for them and bring them in to know that there is hope. And uh, a lot of that is, uh, work is still on. It's, it's not just gone down the drain. A lot is still being done to assure you on that because I'm within the city where uh, uh, the, one of the churches is engaged in this VVF program. Mm. Tony, do you want yes. to take the question about the status of women when they use family planning and whether there's any change that you see? Yeah, um, I, I would start by, by saying my wife is one of those. I would start with my family. Uh, we, we, have, we have three sons, uh, they're well spaced. Uh, recently I was with my wife and uh, we met some of our colleagues, our classmates, and, and, and one person made an interesting comment. Um, I'll, I'll be 10 years in marriage in August. And, and one person made a comment. He says, you look younger than I, I thought you do. And actually, I'd, I'd not told my wife that, but one of the other people told my wife that. So already, and I don't think it was just out of context, I want to believe it really was real, real reality. So I, I want to say that, uh, yes, uh, it, it happens. Uh, people look better. Uh, people live better lives. Uh, <clears throat> compared to other women, they're always stressed. People are always in hospital. Uh, so of course, I haven't done uh, any particular research, but that's just observatory uh, in, 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 a, in a way, yeah. That's what I thought I would mention. But also in Uganda, we are doing some work on a fistula. Uh, some of our hospitals are involved. Uh, but as you know, these are very poor uh, young girls who are not one educated. Uh, they have gone into this. They don't have any income. So definitely somebody has to come in to support them uh, to see that they get the treatment. Now, surgery is very expensive. Sometimes it has to be done twice, thrice, uh, for them to eventually have the whole process uh, underway. So uh, in, a, in a support in that line, we think is, is very, very important. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And maybe on the issue of repositioning family planning in West Africa, I don't know how much that came up in the time that you're here, but there's been new efforts to focus on the uh, unmet need for family planning in West Africa from the US government. 
And are you seeing any impact of that in terms of the attention to these issues in Nigeria? I wouldn't say I've not seen anything directly because that is being done uh, directly by the, the, the public health uh, sector, the government, and uh, we're not directly involved as faith-based organizations in that regard. So I, I don't have enough information to be able to say whether or not something is happening. But for the fact that what I, we are doing and I don't know anything about, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the, any, faith, any church at all is engaged in this activity. So I, I'm, I'm not be able to comment on that because I don't have facts about it. Okay. Another round of questions? Thank you, Janet. I'm Carl Hoffman, the president of PSI. Um, in, in Uganda, we work through PACE, and in Nigeria, our partner is the Society for Family Health. So delighted that you're here. I want to congratulate Ray and CCIH for organizing uh, your visit, and uh, particularly to the Hill, because you were able to experience the difficulty of this conversation in our geography, and uh, it, it uh, puts yours in, in a different context, I think. But um, I, can't resist ask, I can't resist asking the question of the two of you, since you're here representing Uganda and Nigeria in particular, mm -hmm. and you're obviously working with um, faith-based organizations that are invested in the health of their communities, and not just family planning, but I suspect also in the fight against HIV. I'd be interested in your perspectives on the recent public policy changes in the two countries the criminalization of same-sex uh, relationships mm -hmm. and what that means from a health perspective. And another question up here, I think. Hi, um, my name is Margarita Chikina. I'm a public health student. I had just returned actually last month from um, doing my thesis project in Uganda in Fort Porto um, surrounding peer education for HIV prevention. And um, so this is more for Dr. Tumasigye, but maybe for both. Um, as far as family planning, how are you working to be creative and innovative? Um, you would mentioned this idea of the cultural practices, and I'd ran into this a lot in the villages still, you know, family planning is a new idea, it's a change. People still want to have many children. Um, people are resistant to somebody telling them to have fewer. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to be um, just approaching it in a new way or to change some of those cultural norms? And is peer education mm -hmm. uh, a part of the work? And do we have one more in this round? I think we have one more over here, Shepard. Shepard Smith, Institute for Youth Development. Um, I'd like to thank Ray, uh, Mona, Hannah, Catherine, and all the rest who helped, and Anita, who, who helped me uh, evolve on this issue, first of all. Um, two quick questions, one for Donnie, and that's a curiosity question. If uh, you're related to the Honorable Iliota Tumwezeji, Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is a, a general question related to tribes in Africa. I'm really fascinated by the differences in, in every country of the different makeup and how important are tribal leaders in what you do. Sometimes they are spiritual leaders, but m more often they are uh, not. And uh, the difference is, is it important for us from the West coming in to try to help, to, to know some of the differences between uh, tribal attitudes on the issue. Thank you. OK, so we have three big questions. First, the homophobia laws, um, the new approach to addressing cultural norms, particularly in Uganda, and then the last question about the differences in some of the, the tribal attitudes. Mm -hmm. So who would like to begin? I think Savani should start. <laughs> 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 I, 
Yes, for those who don't know, Museveni is the president of Uganda. <laughs> But I'm not the president of Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> but are you related to this guy? So, uh, from thank you very much for those for those questions. No, I'm not related to Eliot at Mwesiji, uh, but we come from. Uh, we are all from the southwest. Uh, he comes from the western part of the south, and I come from the deeper uh, south. Um, but through the uh, through uh, what I would call. Uh, 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 under the theological line, there, there, there was a lot of uh, movement in terms of Christian uh, faith in the southwestern region. And as a result of that, many of the names were changed uh, because of that. So you would hear the names of Tumwesije, which means we trust. You would hear the Mugishas, which means we trust in God. We are Rohanga, we are gods. So there was that. So in respect of the different uh, tribes, uh, rather, semi-clans or semi-tribes in the same region, we have the same names. Yeah. Uh, it is, uh, I, I, I want to say that uh, we are working within uh, the context that, that, that it is at the moment. Uh, the law, uh, the Anti-Homosexuality Act was, was passed in Uganda, and we, we have to work within, within what, what, what was passed. For us, as, uh, as a technical uh, organization, one of our roles has been, uh, we've been asking the government, now that you've passed this law, how are you going to implement it? Okay, and, and sadly, even as I speak now, the law was passed without a clear mechanism of implementing the law. And for us in the health sector, uh, what we've so far seen is that there are lots of, uh, there are a number of press releases, like okay, yesterday or, or day before, uh, we, we, we saw a release of a policy statement by the Minister of Health uh, in view of uh, what is supposed to happen in the health sector vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the law. So by that policy statement for us, uh, we, we, we are more relieved because one of the things that we, we, we were fearing, we had significant fears for, is that as health workers, we are mandated to provide care to everybody irrespective of their sexual orientation. And that's the message that my organization has been pushing for. We never ask uh, patients uh, what uh, is your orientation when they come to us. We've never asked historically. And uh, it is our faith, uh, rather it is our network that has been there over the years. Even when situations were very difficult, everybody was running to us. During the war, when people were abused, they all ran to us. So we've been there for those who are marginalized in the community. Uh, and so, uh, even as, as I speak uh, now, for us, our organization came up with a, a statement already in view of that, throughout the entire network. Ensure that whoever comes and seeks services, you're ensuring confidentiality, you're ensuring care is given. And, uh, and so, at leadership level, the main concern that we had was that now that this law has been passed, what is it for me as a healthcare provider who is going to see this patient? My ethics demonstrates that I'm supposed to give a care. I'm supposed to be confidential. So are you saying that for us as health workers, we no longer exist because of this? So good enough, we've seen our policy statement that is coming in to say uh, all health workers should not give, uh, should not uh, be complacent uh, in ensuring that the code of ethics uh, is implemented. So to me, that's the positive, despite the law that has been passed. Yeah, and, and, and for us, we've been very, very clear on that, and our board has sent out a message, and I'm grateful that the government is also beginning to listen, because uh, I represent uh, the network at the Health Policy Advisory Committee uh, of the Ministry of Health. So the voice is there. And uh, despite the law being passed, at least now we've seen the Minister of Health coming in. I, I want to believe that, that, that this law was, was passed uh, amidst a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, which word would I say? I think there was a lot going on at, at that time. Maybe there were some egos. Maybe the government wants to reverse. But maybe there is a, a, an election coming. Uh, maybe people feel they cannot reverse what has already been, been done. But there are voices inside there that, that feel that this, this went beyond what it should have been. But sadly, as democracy dictates, uh, the bigger the numbers, take the day. So not everybody in Uganda supports the law, okay, the way it is uh, in, in, in that manner. 
Uh, but because democracy dictates that the majority take the day, even those uh, that are minorities uh, have to be there. But the question is, how do you ensure that the rights of those minorities are protected? And I think for us, that's our concern. And that's what we're pushing government to, to get that for. Yeah. So I'm yeah, take it to um, Nigeria. I know in Nigeria, we are very good at making laws. But a lot of our laws are kept on the shelf. And it takes a while until somebody deviates. Then you remember that there's a policy and this is the way it is done. So just like he talked about the issue of implementation, I think it's, it, it, the same goes for, for, for us in, uh, in, in Nigeria. But we know that these, the people who have this sexual orientation are known to us for years. They've been there. And with this law, we know that they will go underground. And a lot more damage can be done. But as a faith community, we know that we have to operate within this law at the national level. But as Christians, we are following in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Compassion and service to whoever comes that is in need of help. And generally, nobody will come up front to tell you this is my sexual orientation. It is when you go on one-on-one -on -one that you're able to know, okay, this is the situation, and nobody will turn them okay. around. Agreed, our religious leaders have spoken a lot against that, but then we are at the receiving end and as professionals. And for me, who have taken an oath not to reject anybody that comes to me for whatever sort of help, irrespective of his race, his religion, his orientation, or whatever, I think I better obey the oath that I have taken, and it's also better for me to obey God than obey man. And within that context, within also the, the Christian community, I see nobody sending away anybody from accessing services in the faith-based health facility in Nigeria. We are always there to receive those who have been rejected elsewhere. In fact, many times they will come, they will say, I'd rather, I'd rather go and die in the mission hospital than staying in these other places because they will take better care of me and they will show me more love, better love and care than if I sit somewhere else and somebody who is working in a disgruntled environment. Mm -hmm. That is what makes us different in going into health service delivery as Christians, to show and demonstrate our faith and what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he was on earth. He never rejected anybody that came to him including the children that were coming when the disciples were sending them away. So that is the way we see ourselves. But then we have to operate cautiously, knowing fully well that officially, uh, if something goes wrong, there, there may be some consequences. Maybe we can turn to the question about new approaches to addressing cultural norms yeah. in yeah. Uganda. Yeah, um, culture, I think as you mentioned earlier, is, is quite a a difficult, <laughs> difficult area uh, to, 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 to get in. But uh, I want to believe that slowly by slowly uh, we will get there. For example, we, uh, in some sections of, of our country, we, we, we have uh, uh, female genital mutilation, uh, which is a very, uh, very bad culture uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that has really been uh, a problem. We begin, we've begun to see that, that change. Uh, we saw the passing of a law criminalizing anybody who does that. Uh, but also the other challenge has, has been that you, you have people who have been in these communities and that is the work that they are doing. Okay, so if you, you stop them from doing that work, what is the alternative? Because some of them live on that work, okay? They have never done anything else. That is their source of income. So as we change the culture, we have to provide for alternative uh, issues. So I think uh, usually it's the economic part of it that tends to move certain things. Uh, you, you, also the other uh, area that, that we've seen uh, is in children uh, who are born uh, and where people have to uh, to extract what they call false teeth. Uh, <clears throat> for, because sometimes children grow teeth quickly and then um, 
people in the community say that is, those, those are false teeth. If you don't remove them, those children will not have, will not develop teeth. Uh, other cultural practices, for example, are what they call extraction of millet uh, in children who come in with pneumonia. A child comes in with pneumonia, can't breathe, and the community uh, feels that you must extract. There is millet in that chest which must be extracted fast. And by causing that extraction, you're damaging further the child. So there are cultural practices that, that to me, considering the experience I worked in the rural setup, are more to do with economic gain. And, and until the economics has, uh, have been sorted, I think it's going to be very difficult to deal with some of those cultural practices. Yeah, that, that, that's, my, that, that's, yeah. that's my take on that. Yeah. yeah. I think in my experience over the years, attempts to change cultural practices are difficult and takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And some of the key issues that we must address, which some of us are, are within the country are trying to do is girl-child education, empowering of women. If these people are properly equipped and the women are, empower, are economically equipped and have some level of social uh, status within their community, they can take their decision and stand out straight. Mm -hmm. And the best way, therefore, is really continuous education, uh, empowerment of women, girl-child education, at least that will help. And if they know and they have the knowledge, they will be able to take a better and, and a more informed decision on their own, rather than allowing themselves to, to, to be twisted by the cultural practices. So that is, is, is key. But at the same time, uh, what we have uh, tried to do, to do, and I think I, I, I showed a slide to some of our people, we use some mothers as role models within the community. Uh, PMTCT has been a key challenge in Nigeria, and there are women who have attended and have access to prevention of mother to child infection by HIV that because they have attended antenatal services, they have been discovered early. Uh, family planning services are also introduced to them so that they don't get immediately pregnant. And then even when they want to get pregnant, they, can, they have a chance of having a baby that is not infected. Now we've made use of these role model mothers and for family planning as well, like somebody mentioned about what are we seeing any changes in these women. There are role models in communities, particularly in the rural areas, that we use them, and they're able to interact with their peer groups, and they're able to break some of these uh, cultural practices that uh, happen. But I think in a lot of African society, girl-child education and women empowerment is key for them to have the knowledge and the ability to take decisions based on inf uh, those information and knowledge that they have. So there was one last question that was about the differences in ethnic groups and tribal groups um, that uh, maybe you want to wrap that into some final remarks uh, because I'm conscious that we are running out of time, though it would be great to continue the discussion for a long time. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can, any comments you have on that last question, you can include in some final remarks about the way you see the way forward. Well, uh, in Nigeria, there are more than 250 ethnic groups. And if you break down to different dialects, you are talking of 500 or more. And uh, it's quite that those differences are there. And therefore, it's difficult for you to model any kind of uh, standard of things that you'll be able to penetrate that will be acceptable to the different and various ethnic groups. But when it comes to health education messages, oftentimes we, feel, we see ourselves having different messages for different ethnic groups and communities so that they can understand it the way within the context of their culture. If you make a poster in northern Nigeria and you take it down to the southern Nigeria, nobody will understand really what you mean by that because of the contra cultural context within it does. So we are often customizing health education materials, BCC materials, and other things, customized based on those various uh, this thing. And key among such, in order to bring about harmony, is that uh, even though we are health, we partner with uh, 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 conflict and peace development organizations 
to see how we can also mainstream these issues amongst the various ethnic groups. It's very easy to see one tribal group rising against the other and so on. And in the absence of peace, and if there's a lot of conflict resulting into going into wars, the health situation is even worsened. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mainstreaming of conflict resolution issues and customizing uh, messages, be it family planning or whatever, to the various ethnic and tribal groups has helped a great deal in passing a lot of messages to our people. Uh, on a final note, I want to say that family planning is a gateway to ma reducing maternal mortality and also reducing child mortality. What, what are those things that kill them? Hemorrhage, unsafe abortion, infection, unwanted pregnancy that results into abortions, but we are aware and we know that if we offer them family planning, a lot of these complications that occur during pregnancy and delivery would be prevented. And our mothers will stay alive to take care of us, the husbands, and their children. Thank you. <laughs> Final thoughts, Thank Tony, you about the, yes. the way forward. Mm. Uh, uh, I want to thank uh, the team here. Uh, for me, one of the things that, that, that I think is critical, um, yes, we have different uh, tribes in Uganda, <clears throat> Uh, but we cannot work alone as a Christian organization. We must work together with those in the same sector, irrespective whether they are Christians or not. And that's the line we are taking in Uganda, and I think it is very important. Because uh, we can, once we join hands with the different groups that are doing different things within the same context, we should be able to achieve, achieve more. So whether we are Christians or others are looking at themselves as uh, uh, non-Christians, I think there is a common point. If we are in health, we could say as Christians are looking at holistic health, but what about the non-Christians? What sort of health are they looking at? It is still health. So can we synergize together and maximize where we want to go? Uh, I want to believe that uh, <clears throat> uh, if we can have uh, children that we can manage, we should be able to live better lives and support uh, uh, our countries uh, to fruition and uh, to uh, liberties that, that we pray for. So I want to thank you very much and uh, I wish you all the best and welcome you to Uganda. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I hope you all will join me in thanking mm -hmm. our panelists. This has been... <laughs> And I want to thank all of you because I think those questions helped elicit uh, a very interesting conversation that we hope to continue with all of you. So thank you again. Safe travels back home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.